Hi, my name's Ethan Lawrence. This is Jesse Leach from Kill Switch Engage. Hi, I'm Scotty Wartsu. Hi, my name's Sean Smith. Hi, my name is Deshaun Kiva. This is Ryan McCombs from the band Soil. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Luigi Cage and Lash LaRue. My name's Steve, I play bass in Low Lives. You're listening to the Chronicles of Podcasts with Todd and Jamie. They're fucking awesome. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Chronicles of Podcast. And these right here are the Chronicles of Low Lies. It is I, Jamie, and joining me, as always, is this handsome fella right here. Hi, guys. It's Tom. We're really sorry there's no show this week. Hit it! Ladies and gentlemen, this week we are bringing you a very special guest. This week's guest is a member of an incredible band who are currently celebrating the release of their debut record, Freaking Out. Boys and girls, I know that you don't care what I think, but I am now, I'm not a liar when I tell you that today we are joined by Steve Lucerelli as we bring you the Chronicles of Low Lives. Fuck's sake. <laughs> well, I, I won't be freaking out, but uh, it's actually... <laughs> Say again, yeah. sorry? Luca Rally. Luca Rally. Ah, see, see for me off. No, it's, it's the fact it's just maybe it's actually not Italian. Isn't it Italian surname? It it is. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm I'm only a, a quarter Italian, but I got the full the full last name. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> I can't help it. Sometimes I talk with my hands, and that's uh, you know that's a, I guess a family heirloom passed down. <laughs> but I, I understand it. But uh, if you if you see two C's, that's a ch. If it's C E, it's a s. But if it's a C A, it's a ka. Love it. I guess imagine I'd sort of just go on stage, Steve, and just be like, "Hey, how we doing? What's going on?" <laughs> so, fun story. My my wife has never seen me without a beard ever. Um, I've had a beard since the, since before we met, and. Um, Basically, I've I've bargained a pair of uh, dark blue Carhartt overalls for me be to be Mario for Halloween <laughs> this year. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there's a chance that it'll just be this for a minute. Uh... <laughs> he did the accent. It's me. Yeah, I mean, I'm. A <laughs> 90s, right? This is, you know, we're, we're full circle. I mean, I had the original, you know, Nintendo that, you know, you had to blow into whenever it didn't yeah. work. And for some reason, that fixed it. But what I always and loved about those, it says on the back, do not blow yeah. into the cartridge. <laughs> Which, that's the only thing that works. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Phenomenal. That impression was great, by the way. So I can't <laughs> wait. To Please put that on social media or put it somewhere for us all to enjoy. <laughs> I got a, I, I do have a, a fairly large uh, wrench that I'll just carry around. And... <laughs> you, Steve, you've already won Halloween. It's not even here yet. You've already won. <laughs> I usually have a hard time figuring. I, I love Halloween so much. It's my favorite holiday. And every year I get the worst case of Halloween blue balls where I'm like, I. <laughs> I can't think of the best thing to do. And then before I know it, it's within the week and, and I've blown it. And then I have to, you know, I don't know, be a vampire again for the hundredth oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> or so a cat, is, weirdly. That? Or a cat, weirdly, because everyone becomes a cat for some reason. I've never been a cat, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess I could put that in my back pocket. <laughs> well, what, what's what's the most common Halloween? Witch, vampire, cat. What else is like a real common thing to do on Halloween? So in the past few years, Harley oh. Quinn. <laughs> it's that, but then it's all the slutty versions of everything else. <laughs> yes. and, yeah, like nurse outfits. But put a little <laughs> blood down your mouth and then you saw it. <laughs> <laughs> yep, vampire nurse. Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, we should probably crack on a little bit here. You know, but... <laughs> How's your uh, how's your personal Monday going so far? Fantastic! I get to talk with you guys. Today is a good day. Yeah. Stop it, you! I see what you're doing. I see <laughs> what you're doing. <laughs> I'm just trying to stay cozy, man. I'm I'm <laughs> love it. So, 
Before we talk all things low lives, we want to learn a bit more about yourself, sir. Take us right back to the days of your youth. What did you want to be when you were growing up in your more formative years? Has it always been music for you or something else? It's always been music, yeah. Um, my uh, my dad is a jazz musician. And so I grew up with him practicing every night and just being in that um in that space obviously i don't play jazz i've played jazz but it's it's been a long time but um yeah i can remember in fifth grade they always have you when you're 16 and you're like when i'm 16 i'm gonna be a rock star not knowing you know you're not able to think of what that actually means mm. as you have to put it to practice you're just like that's what i want to do like ever since i had um my sister's old Walkman. So for anyone who's not born in this <laughs> century, uh, Walkman is a radio with headphones and it's just a radio. It doesn't, ha it, what, it was before the tapes, you know, I had my sister's old one. And so I was tuning into, you know, rock radio when I was, you know, fourth, fifth grade, maybe even before that. And so... I just, it's always been that, like, even like, I remember listening to the radio the day Kurt Cobain died, like, wow. I was obsessed with it then. Um, and I was very young, I was probably like, six years old. So, I mean, as soon as I could be into it, I've been into it. And, and younger me, I think would be pretty impressed with how far I've come. Um, so I've always wanted to do that. And I, um, I wanted to play guitar originally, and then um, I got persuaded to play bass. Um, and I've always played bass. I've never, I can dabble on guitar, but I think in bass. So it's a different, it's a different mechanism. Um, whereas, you, you know, it's usually like, okay, well, this guy already has a guitar and this guy already has a guitar. <laughs> So, you know, if you want to be in a band, you got to be the bass player. Like, it's different for me. I've never been that guy. So I feel I feel awkward when I pick up a guitar. But when I pick up a bass, I'm like, okay, this is the language that I speak. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I feel that massively. I used to play bass. And whenever I picked up a guitar, I was like, I just don't know what I'm doing here. What's going on? But Yeah, I got, like, big, stupid hands. And so... <laughs> You know, they work better with uh, larger strings. <laughs> Makes sense. I love it. Absolutely love it. So were you influenced heavily by your parents? They say dad was a jazz musician. Like, what about your mum when she listened to when she was uh, when you were growing up? Soft rock. Like, tons of 80s soft rock. So, you know, there's a, there's a chapter in my brain that knows every Celine Dion song um, by heart. <laughs> But I, I don't visit the chapter very often, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, you know, I just we, we always had music, something. Um, and my uncles, so my my dad and my uncle uh, were jazz music. My dad still plays. My uncle's passed, but they played together since they were like twelve years old, and so they're. They had a whole career. My dad was a, a music teacher, actually. So it was just kind of like all around me constantly growing up. And so even now, like at home, you know, our house is never quiet. I'm always put, putting a record on or, you know, streaming music, new things that I find, you know. Um, so, yeah, music's just always been that thing. But funny enough, when um when it came time to go to college i i was planning on becoming a music teacher that was you know following in the family footsteps and and my dad was like absolutely not you will not go to school for music find anything else um so i went for a year for creative writing and i burned out so hard that um my my first band was called uh once nothing that was you know we put out a couple eps and a full length um but they were my local band in pittsburgh and so 
they um they had some member changes and they asked me if I wanted to play bass and so I literally dropped out of college to go on tour and basically my parents were like what the fuck do you think <laughs> you're doing? and I you know I had that like I was never like um I was never a real rebellious kid I mean in my mind with the music that I listened to but it never really came out I you know nice person do your homework whatever but my coming of age was when I was like no I'm going to do this this is my dream and I hope that you support me because if you don't you'll never see me again and that was a really intense sort of like I don't I, I still like to this day I don't regret it but that was a really difficult thing for them and it's it's mm. drawn like a hard boundary on me doing this however I can do it for as long as I can do it so that's my personal you know that's what got me into touring got me into being you know where I'm at today is is very much you know having to be like hey yeah I'm not going to follow your path unfortunately for you sorry wow I, just quickly going back to the Celine Dion thing, I'd love it if he's dropped a track with hints of like influence from her. That'd be absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. Do you know what I mean? It's like just just little hints, not like a full on. I mean, if you did a whole real Celine Dion ballad, that'd be unbelievable. But I can't see that <laughs> happening somehow. So, <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, on the next record, you might find something somewhere. Steve, don't tease. Don't tease my <laughs> You know, we, we we do like to have little fun nuggets here and there. So I don't know. I can't say that it won't be, but you'll have to make that. You'll have to, you know, sift through the comments on the next one to see. Yeah. <laughs> Although she's having it, she's having it, you know, just like everything from the 90s, I think for a while there you couldn't be less cool than Nickelback and Celine Dion and I feel like at this point they're having like this epic revival where because Celine Dion did that song for Deadpool 2 and now everyone oh, yeah. yeah I can't um uh something with ashes it's like um I can't you can find it yeah. but it's a fantastic song but it they they were genius when they did it they made it the focal point of uh the like the climax of the movie and it's like let faith come out of ashes or something like that and now Celine Dion is back being cool again um and so is Nickelback and all of these bands and things are really is cyclical where it's coming back where people are not ironically listening, but being interested in Nickelback never died for me. Never. You can't Sorry, hold a I good mean... you can't hold a good Canadian down. That's what the proof of the, that's what the message is here. <laughs> oh, but... <laughs> you know what it is? Everyone's having um documentaries come out. Oh and... yes. Sorry to interrupt you, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They've got a Nick they've got a Nickelback documentary and and um you know, much like Motley Crue, you know, people are, are rediscovering the way that things used to be. And so, you know, there is a, a throwback revival that, hey, I'm I'm here for it. So I was there for it, but now I'm here for it. Again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so going back to the bands that like you were you were influenced by, obviously you, you can pick up a multiple of sort of sound different sounds in low lives. What were the bands that inspired you when you were first learning to play the bass? uh yeah i mean i um rancid was a, a huge one i mean you know matt freeman from rancid is one of the best bass players of all time i mean the i know everyone talks about be be it that but it literally is that good the bass solo in maxwell murder is when i first heard it, i was like there's no way that guy is playing like that like absolutely not it's not even possible. It is possible. Um, but, you know, I mean, 
Red Hot Chili Peppers, Primus, um, The Clash. The Clash is probably the biggest influence that I have. They're just, you know, the the scope of musicianship. I mean, I could put some Clash songs on. My dad would be like, oh, this isn't so bad because they had that like jazz influence Joe Schrummer had that classical education that made it seem like he could pull that he did pull that stuff off and also use like broken uh grammar to be a man of the people with a, an above average ability to play music and that sort of dichotomy I always loved about that band and so you had like this deep reggae influence but also you know um you know London Calling as a as a song and the, the bass part in that just always blew my mind I mean so that when I when I started to learn the songs those were the influences and then obviously bands like Primus like Les Claypool is insane and every bass player ever has been like, how do how does he do that? <laughs> and I still watch Prime and stuff. And I'm like, I knowing all that I know now about being a professional musician, I still go, how the fuck does he do that? <laughs> like some you know primeval bass angel wizard. I don't know. <laughs> That's a great description of Les Claypool if ever I've heard one. <laughs> I don't know how, like, I watch stuff and I'm like, fucking hell, like that, I just, you know, to be able to sing and do that and, you know, perform, I, he's just, he's really something special. So, but all of those things, I, I was interested in that. And I think you kind of have to have that real obsession, especially to take things as far as I've, taking them, you know, it's being a musician in 2024 is incredibly difficult. Mm. Um, so you have to have those initial years of just pure obsession to really wind up here. I think. <laughs> you, you are right. Like we talked to a lot of musicians and they say, you know, it's, it's not an easy business. You do this for the passion. Like you do this because it's 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 in you. You need to do this. It's not because you want to go out there and make money because it's just not happening nowadays. I mean, unfortunately, you know, we haven't figured out how to fix the monetization of music. No. Uh, you know, it's it's so interesting. You know, twenty four years after the fact, being like, yeah, Metallica was kind of right about the way that they were approaching the Napster thing. I think the way they did it was brash and they seemed, um, especially Lars, you know, I love Metallica, but that was a bad look for them. They could have approached that whole thing differently. Um, but in terms of the music industry side of things, streaming is just not really a viable option for for us now and so um you know unless you're overloading servers you know it's it's a lot harder to do that stuff whereas like you know even if you sold like you know two thousand cds at ten dollars a pop right you're you're at least like you're generating revenue that can be used to get a line of credit for the band or whatever. And, you know, 2000 streams gets you what, like a dollar, not even. That's disgusting. So, so for, I'm not here to complain about music finances. I'm just saying it is very much now more than ever strictly for that obsession and that love of doing it. Because you're not going to get rich. I mean, I think Snoop Dogg said, he's like, how the fuck are you going to have a billion streams and not make a million dollars? He's not wrong. That's That really is the way that it is. And so, like, knowing that, I feel like there's an appreciation for musicians that hasn't quite come in. Like, how much it takes for us to do this is really that, like, that drive inside 
to, you know, it's a lot easier not to do it. <laughs> like you just get a job and work your life, but we can't. And I think every member of Low Lives, we all share in that same sort of collective insanity. That's like, you know what? We are all miserable people if we don't do this. We all need this because it's who we are. And it's not always convenient to, you know, put your, your own life on hold, go somewhere for two weeks and, you know, come back with battle scars or come back in the hole or whatever. Like it really is what's in us that drives us to do it. And if we didn't have that obsession, you know, it's it's a hard time for music. So we're not getting it, we're not in it to be rich. Um because we're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's horrible. And you know, it something does need to change, like you say. So really doesn't need to change. I, I kind of had I'd had this thought, you know, I lived in Hollywood for a long time and um when there was when all the actors and everyone was striking, I was like, musicians should get in on this. I mean, they're yeah. the studios are, you know, they're controlling things. You've got the writer strike, then the actor strike. Like the musicians should also go on strike and try and gain back some of the some of our rights. I mean, in in Hollywood in particular, the union is very strong for like SAG AFTRA. But the musicians union, you know, I'm sure someone out there will disagree with me, but my experience with the musicians union is they don't have enough to offer to really go to the to the table to advocate for musicians' rights against, you know, Spotify or Apple Music, all of which we're super grateful because a lot of people find out about us through that, but the streaming model doesn't lend itself to a real sense of um, commerce, which is really when you take your band out of the garage, you are now, you know, as much as we hate this, a product. Like you are as good of a product as you are conveying. So like the best products are the ones you don't even know that you're, you're witnessing, right? Like the artistry is solid, the recording is solid, but all of those things take time and you know, we can't go to Spotify and ask for an advance on our next album, even though they will happily list it and they'll list it for a fraction of a penny per stream. You know, whereas like the the the, the truth is that if you're an actor and you're you're well represented in the way that the streaming studios they're they're producing a lot they're keeping the studios fed and the you know the writers and the actors like like amazon is employing those people to create content that hasn't pulled over to the musicians yet so amazon and apple and spotify and napster and these are all of those like they're not giving advances to the artists to bring them more music um, and so that's the element that I think is, it hasn't caught up. So, and the record labels fit in there in a different way, but the people who are consuming, you know, I know that the CEO of Spotify is worth $5 billion. Like, um, Fuck. yeah, <laughs> he's worth like three or four billion more than Paul McCartney. And wow, I don't know. Is there something wrong with that? He's a tech guy. He made a tech program and it's successful. And I can't blame anyone for that. But at the same time, like something needs to, to fix itself so that musicians aren't at great personal financial risk all the time. Um, because, you know, then like with COVID restrictions and, and all of this stuff, if you, if something happens, you know, your SOL and it's just like, 
well, you're a musician, you know, figure it out or or don't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, insane. It's crazy as fuck, man. I mean, yeah, something went wrong somewhere and no one did anything about it. And now we're like, uh, how do we get here? What yes. what's yeah. happened on the way? Like <laughs> it's true. I mean, I you know, I I'm not like bitter about it. I think it's just it's a thing that we need to solve because music education and music as an expressive art form are very important to the world. Yeah. And you know, that it, there's no reason why it shouldn't be a viable thing for every for everyone to make money and be healthy and yeah. you know I, I hear no one talk about musician mental health. It's not a thing. Um, right. uh, do you guys hear anything like that? Because I, I have no, no. We we had talked to a label that unfortunately it didn't work out, but they had they were looking to launch a business model where all the bands in that label were looked after mental health wise and i thought that that was a really unique sort of it's a great idea i mean you know like maybe it's antithetical to punk rock because punk rock at least traditionally um thrives when you're at your lowest <laughs> <laughs> i mean you got a point yeah <laughs> um so I don't know. I haven't really. I, I I've thought about this many times, but you know, it's it's an evolving thing. I'm not like I said. I'm not bitter about the time that we are in music. It's just something that we need to collectively work out because it can't go away because this is like the world's oldest means of expression. Even if you go back to drums and drum circles, like we need this. We need the interaction. So we just need to find out how it's not so devalued. Um, anyway, that's my rant. No, <laughs> and I did not expect this term we were taking, Steve, to be honest with you. But, uh, <laughs> no, I love it. It's <laughs> from Mario to music. Yeah. I mean, you never know with me, and that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we're all here today. <laughs> but... A question I like to ask, and I know you probably get this a fucking lot, but I'm always intrigued by what came before. Your name, Low Lives. How did you come up with it? But what did you have beforehand? Because I always like the, oh, we were called Bread Basket or something. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> um, to be honest with you, uh, Low Lives was all already the name whenever I came into it. Okay. Uh, yeah, Lee had that name... Uh, I guess just set aside for a while. And um, so basically I've known Luke for a really long time and um, he had gotten out of the music industry for a bit. Um, but we had, we'd kind of always had each other's backs like, Oh, I heard of this gig is for a while. We were both hired guns for oh, okay. a very long time. And so we'd always try and throw each other anything we could. And um, a fun Luke story is that he uh, he played his first show for a few years with my old, I had a shoegaze band, they're called Night Jacket. They're still active in, in LA. Um, but uh, it's a very quiet music and we needed a drummer and I, I got Luke to do, I think, two shows with Night Jacket. <laughs> and we had him uh we had him using brushes, not drumsticks, and <laughs> he was still <laughs> too loud. <laughs> but um so yeah, that would have been uh in twenty 20- uh 2015 i think end of 2015 is when we we played some shows and we were just we'd always been toying with it and so after luke and lee met he called me one day he's like hey i i got this band it's called low lives it's a thing like i want you in it and so i it was right after we had um my son 
and I was on hiatus from playing with the Ataris. And I was kind of like, well, yeah, like, I'll take any opportunity to come jam with you. I didn't know Lee at that point, but I mean, we, you know, we, we had met at the bar years or like before he was like with the defiled and I didn't know who he was. I was just like, that guy looks cool. And so when we, we got to the, the jam room, it was like, Oh, Hey, I know you. Like, oh yeah. I know you too. And that was kind of like the birth of the band. So we, we've never not been low lives. Um, it's, and it's, you know, through thick and thin, we've, it's been the four of us and that's kind of how it started. That's amazing. I had the vision of you when you all saw each other, you did the whole Spider-Man meme where you were pointing at each other like, I know you. Yeah. Hey, I know you too. Like, <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. We're, I mean, you know, LA is a huge place, but in the industries that you're in, it's really not that big. You know, everyone tends to know or at least know someone who knows. Okay. So, you know, if you're at a cool bar, chances are you're at a cool bar with other cool people and someone's going to know someone. And, and so that's what they go, oh, Hey, I know you. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, we've just been like, you know, best friends ever since. So it's, you know, for band formation, unfor unfortunately, I can't say that we were, I can't think of anything, you know, there's so many crazy band names the stupid goonies or whatever that nah, it wasn't the... <laughs> <laughs> love it love it so so i was doing my research before i was sitting down to talk to you and it seems you guys came really close after a hastily arranged uk tour in 2018 what was the story here because it seems a bit mental <laughs> yeah um so uh here's the scene right we had been a band for about a year at that point and but we hadn't taking everything that we know about how the music industry works i mean there's collectively like 40 years experience or more in the industry so we what we wanted to do was we wanted to have enough songs written we wanted to have the recording quality be good you know, we've got our sickle logo, we had our font and everything. And when we were fine, when it was finally time to play our first show, we played with Moose Blood um, at a sold out show in LA. Um, and then we were kind of just like still easing into letting the cat out of the bag. And Luke was great friends with the guys from the U's, said, hey, you know, would you mind letting us open for your show at the observatory in Anaheim? I said, yeah, of course. There's no opener, you guys. And then um, so that was our second show. Our third show, uh, Bo who Bo Rochelle, who plays in Seosin, who does all of our um, recording, he was like, Oh, you guys want to open for Seosin? Like, absolutely. So we had three sold-out shows we launched a band on, and then um we were like oh the use is going on tour in uh europe and the uk in february let's see if we can get that like let's just see and they were like yeah we'd love to have you guys like this is amazing so here's the scene we're driving to our first date in sweden uh pearl jam is on the radio vibes are great we're just you know we've booked our van we've got merch we've rented all of our gear we're hot and ready to go right first day it was supposed to be in sweden luke gets a call from the tour manager so music goes down says hey okay yeah hangs up tours canceled like what and He's like, yeah, okay. So we pull off at a rest stop in Belgium. And this it's not unlike the US, they sell beer and like at the side of a rest stop. Um and like, yeah, you know, there's been some family stuff. Um tours cancel. They were supposed to come meet us tomorrow. So I went in to the gas station, like, 
I'm slamming a beer. I don't care. I need this right now. I'm so, <laughs> you know, because we've, you know, like I was saying, like we leverage our own personal finances to do this. Yeah. Like, and we're, we're moving to the point where it is more financially viable for us to do this, but it's still based on our personal finances, especially at that point. We had no representation, done three shows, headed to, to Europe. So I'm trying to sort it out and I'm slamming this beer. I'm like, I don't feel any more calm. And I look and I accidentally <laughs> grab the zero comma zero beer, like a non-alcoholic. <laughs> just you know so we kind of went okay it's like friday the first show was going to be on saturday what do we have as our options to do so we're like well no matter what we have to go back to england so we got on the ferry we you know two hours after getting off the ferry get on the ferry we're we're back and we're just like who do we who do we call what can we do because at the end of it, we were like, well, we we think we get to do a BBC in studio session. Um, so do we just like go home or do we come back? Do we try and slug it out? Do we, what do we do? <laughs> and so unlike the US, it seems like in England and Europe, when the weekend hits, everyone's just like, cool, phone off. Like no one does much. Where in the US, it's very common to have access to everyone at all times you know even on your days off so we're like cool nothing's really going to get sorted until monday um, but we'll put in a, as many calls as we can i mean i'm reaching out to people that i barely know through facebook that might know a promoter somewhere in the uk just to try and find anything and so monday rolls around and people were just like, yeah, sure. We'd love to add you to this show. And so we picked up, I think like seven shows on like wow. in one day. We were like, whoa, okay. And then Tuesday rolls around and we went from having an entire tour get canceled to having 14 days, no days off. And then 15 oh performances with, um, with the BBC being the, the last one. So, I mean, just. <laughs> Like what an incredible punk rock way to, to pull a full tour out of nowhere. Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's the story where and you know the routing wasn't great. It was like you know Scotland, then you know I don't know, like Exeter, and then up to Manchester. I mean it was just crisscrossing each other, but we did it. And it was a cool, I mean, the shows were hit or miss. We were just happy to have shows. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of that, um, that scrappiness that we still have, like, you know, what's punk rock, right? Like it's, there's a genre attached to it, but it's also a mentality. Um, and I think that we, very clearly demonstrate that we're a punk band um if genre not genre alone but like an ethos like we do get the work done no matter what <laughs> that is unreal <laughs> absolutely unreal so and a lot of those people are still we're still in our our band universe i mean it, it's you know, the the more you play, the more people you meet, the more people come into your universe and they they stick around or, you know, you're especially now like overloaded with information constantly, but we have tried our best to just show gratitude and show like, you know, appreciation for everyone that helped us out then you know, to still be able to come to the UK and do it and have it not be this thing that just like, oh, that fizzled, that was a weird thing that happened. And then, you know, it's fizzled. Like we're very much still front of mind with <clears throat> the people that helped us with that. And yeah, that's our story. What a story. Like, 
that's gonna be so heartwarming to you guys as well especially like your third fourth show ever has been just like on the spot like shit panic oh we got a tour there you go sorted <laughs> yeah no absolutely i mean but just like the the pure like panic and devastation of like <laughs> We have all of this merch made and we've prepaid the van for two weeks and what? Um, you know, that's, I don't think a lot of people will thankfully ever experience any sort of panic like that because uh, it's just, a, just like we're out here as like, a, you know, Bands, I don't care what you say, are business ventures. You hope to, you know, turn a profit. And if you don't need that profit to be millions of dollars, good on you, right? Not saying that like that's ever really the stated goal. The goal is just to play more music. Um, that is that is the goal. It's not, um, for me anyway, it's not like, oh, I want to make six figures playing music. It's just like, I just want to be able to be a person and continue making more music. And so for us, we stick our necks out there and to have that pure, just like devastating panic of like, holy shit, we're here and everything is completely falling apart. <laughs> it's, what? That's an insane, it's an insane story. But like you say, like fair play to you guys as well, because a lot of people are going, Let's just take the hit. Let's just go home. That I'm sure we can make some work when we get back. But no, you guys fucking stuck it out. We're like, we want shows. What can we do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's you know, that's the punk rock element. I mean, my favorite shows are are the the ones where people are just like diving over each other, and you know, it's like a big um, sea of people just all feeling feeling all the feels to the music <laughs> and a lot of times those are really small shows and and there's nothing wrong with that i mean imagine i i mean i got to see green day play at this small venue in in austin years ago and it was just like oh man because you don't really see bands like that do small shows where like everyone knows every word you know, and you're in a 200 person room and it's just freaking bananas and people are stage diving and, you know, that whole show of, you know, humanity, like that's super cool. And and so for us, we're just like, man, if this is, you know, if there's 13 people here or 1300, you're getting the same energy from us. Uh, and that's that punk element where, you know, I can't turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're about to go on tour with Alkaline Trio. <laughs> yeah. I mean, life is fun. <laughs> and it's here. It's over here as well, which would be unbelievable. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, I saw Alkaline Trio and Thrice in Pittsburgh, I think, in two thousand and. 2004 2005 um at a small venue and that i i remember that show is an amazing show now to to come full circle 20 years later and get to to go on tour with them it's you know those are the times when i i think back to the when i'm 16 i'm gonna be a rock star and i'm like <laughs> i won't be at 16 but you're gonna do all that. Oh. So I guess we should talk about it because the end of May you released your debut album, Freaking Out. What's the reception been like to the record now that the dust has settled? I I mean, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, I think when you one thing that's scary for artists is when you commit to a record, like record kind of has two meanings, right? Because like on one hand, it's the physical thing that you can hold, mm. but it's also, it's the record of 
who you were when you wrote those songs and who you, you know, what you were going through at the time that you wrote the songs. And I think that it's, it's awesome to finally have it out because now we can kind of move on from it um, and continue the growth with it. Um, and you never know. I mean, shit, like, I always think about the way in which the music industry has changed now. Someone like Bruce Springsteen and his first album, you know, was a commercial flop. I mean, in retrospect, it's a very important album and did end up becoming successful. But, you know, nowadays with the way that things go, you kind of really only get one true shot. Um, and luckily for us, like, we don't care how many shots that we get because it's not for anyone other than us because we need this. Um, so the success of the record isn't going to dictate whether the band continues. The band's going to continue because we need it to continue. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is in some ways, the success of the record is inconsequential to us moving forward. On the other hand, um, the reviews have been overwhelmingly positive. Um, and we try not to read too much into it because sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's depressing seeing what other people think of you um, versus how you think of yourself. Mm. But uh, it seems like people are are getting it and, um, you know, <laughs> the, the best thing uh, we, we played in France last month, right? And this French guy came up and he was so brutally honest. And I love this. He goes, uh, your band is uh, not very original, but you're fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, hey, man, you get it? I mean, we're, <laughs> you, know, you know, four guys, two guitars, bass, drums. Um you know, we know, we know what we're influenced by. We know who we are. Um, and we love that about us. And for someone who's never seen us before to say something like that, it's like, yeah, it's, it was kind of a, an offhanded heartwarming compliment. <laughs> that's the Europeans for you, Steve. That's what they do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. No, that's that's it's the most French uh, thing I could I it couldn't. <laughs> write. But you know the response has been great. And, um, you know I think some of the stuff that's that we've seen happen that is really cool for us is like watching people on on YouTube do. I just got this album. I'm gonna review it. I'm gonna listen to it for the first time. And watching how they inter interpretate what we've done. Um, and it what even beyond that is watching people do, you know, guitar covers, drum covers. I mean, we, someone even did a vocal cover of, of Loser. We're just like blown away because whether or not we'll, we'll ever be as important like... Primus or the Clash was to me. I mean, you. <clears throat> I don't know. Can you hope so? I I don't I don't know. Uh, I don't know what you can hope for. But the fact that we are able to aid people into continuing to play music, I think that's amazing. I think that that's like that's a win on so many levels. Even just be a musician learn a song that you like we're we're continuing the culture i mean it, it's you know that's my that's my favorite thing that's happened um with the reception of the album and you know i think 
even just putting out a full length album these days, it's kind of antithetical to what people in the music industry tell you. Everyone says, just release a bunch of singles. Don't do a full album. But the album is, that's the snapshot of who we were when we wrote those songs and, and how we were <laughs> recorded them. And, um, you know, the artwork is amazing and it, it, it all fits together in a way that we're very proud of. And so, you know, that no one thinks it's shit. Well, some people think it's shit, but you know, I don't care what they think anyway. It's not <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not not to not to suck dick as you're here, but it's fucking great. Like I always know if I think an album's good when the last track ends, I go oh because it's finished. And I did that when I was listening to it, so it got the Jamie seal of approval. I absolutely fucking love the record from start to start to end. It is fantastic. Thank you. So, I mean, that's, you know, it's so kind of you to say that. And, um, you know, I know, like, I love albums in that same way. Um, that's how I listen to music. I will, you know, there are bands and there are albums that leave me being like, man, I wish there was more. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that you you take in that into your personality a bit right like the words and when you listen to that album what it reminds you of certain albums bring comfort certain albums are reminiscent if i'm you know like listening to alice in chains i'm reminded of summertime in pittsburgh going to you know uh, drive with my dad, being in the back seat with my headphones on, and I can relive that again. And so that sort of like auditory memory is so special. So to hear that you've connected with the album in that way, I hope that it becomes a snap point in your life that's really important to you. So that every time you listen to the album, you're reminded of something, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's good, then great. If it's a painful time, like hopefully it brings that sort of like comfort. Yeah. So I think that's one thing that music can do. It does do. It brings comfort to people who need it. And the more neurons you get to fire for, you know, freaking out, the, you know, you'll remember this time and it will either be uh, happiness or it'll be comfort, I think. Absolutely. I'm, I'm like that. If I'm ever feeling like a bit blue and I feel like I need cheering up, I'll stick on a fucking great album that I really resonate with. Oh, and it fine. just lifts the spirits right up. Like, yeah, come on. Hell yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'm after this, I'm going to go put music on in the house. I, I have to. Like... But when it comes to singles, because obviously you mentioned about how the Spotify generation now is like singles, singles, just you know, that was great. What's next? That was great. What's next? Do you struggle with what to release as singles? Because obviously you dropped uh, You Don't Care, Lose a Liar and Freaking Out. Right? Did you struggle to decide on what to drop or was it just like, that'd be great to go out first. That'd be great to go out second. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a, a conversation with the label. Um you know, and, and, you know, I think in terms of um, what, what the role of a record label is in 2024 is different than in decades past. And, and one thing that I'll say about Spine Farm and that I love about working with Spine Farm, and by the way, they're not paying me to say this. I've got a lot of <laughs> music industry. Um, but they have been kind of like a suggestive guiding hand in this. Mm -hmm. So I think they recognize that we as four guys have done the best that we could do DIY. Um, and they are helping us in ways that, you know, like there's certain things that are obvious, right? Like, the the radio format like verse core you know intro verse chorus verse double chorus bridge 
double chorus outro, right? Like that's that format is it lends itself to radio. You get the same hook three times, right? Um, so when it came to picking singles, obviously freaking out and liar um and loser kind of follow those. Um and even I, I guess so does uh you don't care, but it's a bit more um avant-garde isn't really the right word for it but it's you know it starts off with a guitar solo and that's not something that <laughs> you see very often in in music these days so but picking the singles the label had a plan for how they wanted to do it okay. and you know our own plan may not have been too dissimilar like if you look at the other singles that we've released it's been kind of like one main song, then one B side. Um, oh. You know, kind of our first number of releases. You know, the Burn Forever EP was was kind of um, you know three songs and an acoustic song to get our what we were doing out there into the world, and then we kind of had different plans for that initial batch of recordings. But we did end up doing them all as singles. So one main, more radio friendly song, and then one um, one single, still kind of in the same sort of verse chorus format. Um, so all that is to say, Spine Farm didn't come in with a heavy hand and tell us this is what we're doing. It was just like this is what we're thinking, and we were like yeah we're we're right in line so that whole process with them has been great and i think in terms of what you expect from a label these days you know there it's definitely not an obsolete um business entity they're they do have the expertise and the time involved in the industry to be very relevant it's just the the way in which things work as we talked about with like the streaming platforms that affects the record labels too so <clears throat> i think they're more of an ally to the artist at this point which was a thing that was a trope for record labels where it was like the label's gonna screw you like um you know our experience with Spine from this far has been very, very positive, like all the way forward. So um, I hope that answers the question in a long, yeah. a very long winded. You can just. It's great. <laughs> we love it. We love people that talk. That's the whole point. We do a whole show around this. So we love that, you know, your head turning the stories. It's great. So I could sit here and see you for hours. <laughs> cool. I mean, you know, it, I, you know, I, I like it too. So good. <laughs> So we mentioned earlier on, obviously, you're about to embark on the UK tour supporting Alkaline Trio, but you're also having an incredible festival season. You've got Louder Than Life coming up, yeah. uh, Future Shock, Aftershock rather as well. But you have just played Download Festival here in the UK. Now, minus the weather, I heard Download was fucking phenomenal this year. How was it for you guys? Well, uh, <laughs> apologies. I, I we, We're just getting over COVID again. So I have a lingering cough. So Ooh, um, all good, man. I hope you're okay, though. Yeah, yeah, no, we're good. It's just the uh, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, for for Americans, you know, downloads arguably the biggest UK festival that you know you don't have to come over to England to know about Download Fest, um, and. I've just been wanting to play that festival for as long as I can imagine. I mean, Reading and Leeds being the other one, we we did Reading and Leeds in 2018, which was phenomenal as well. Um, but download just the the type of people, because Reading and Leeds has kind of all mixes of people, and download is like this is a rock festival, and it's with people that like rock, and that's so cool. Um and yeah, I mean, yeah, the weather was a little bit shit uh the the mud was something else um 
but yeah, the show was great. And I, I guess one of the, the things, you know, we, we went and did press and we did a lot of press during that which was something that we hadn't really considered because we were like trying to map out the day, like, okay, we'll go see this band. And then, I mean, I've never been there, so I didn't realize how far everything is apart. Yeah. There. Yeah. Um, it was massive. Um, <clears throat> so, but we actually ended up having so many meetings and stuff. The only band we got to see was Pantera. Um, which, hey, I never got to see Pantera um, during their heyday. So being able to stand there with uh, Luke didn't make Luke was um, hanging out with his family, but me, Lee and Jax just sat there watching Pantera. And we were like, this is really the only thing we're going to get to see at Download Fest, but it's freaking Pantera. So <laughs> like, you know, what, what an incredible day for us just, you know, but two of my favorite things, play a show and go get to see a legendary band. I, mean, I grew up with Pantera. I was gonna say, if there's any band there you're going to pick to go watch, you picked a good one, to be fair. So, oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> like, and we watched in the crowd, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't big time it on the side of the stage or anything <laughs> that we're like, no, we're Pantera fans watching it happen. Like, I can hell, like that was awesome. Amazing. So obviously we'll try that one again. <laughs> a question I like to ask all of our musical guests. If people are listening to this and they're going, I like the cut of this guy's jib, I'm gonna go check out his low life band. They sound all right. Yeah. What's a couple of songs in the back catalogue you're extra proud of that you think really sum up the low life sound for you? Yeah, I I mean on on this album, um we didn't so my favorite song on this album was called Swan Dive. And I was hoping that it would have made the single cut. Um, who knows? Maybe Freaking Out will end up being like Moby's play where every song is a single. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see that happening. But um, Swan Dive on the new record would be where I would point you to um, to start. Uh, obviously... Burn Forever was the first song we ever released. It was the first song we kind of all collaborated and it wasn't really finished without all of us. Um, so that would be number two. And then we have a song, um, as I checked the plays, it's our least popular song, unfortunately. It's called Hate, Greed, Liars, and Thieves. Um, come on, Messi. Sorry, my puppy's here. He wants to say hi. Oh, we love an animal visit. Oh, here he is. Yeah. oh, he's got a jumper on. <laughs> so, all right. Um, anyway, we have a song called Hate, Greed, Liars, and Thieves. And we've started playing it. We added it back to the set for those Atreyu shows. We didn't do it at download, but um, it's probably my favorite song that we have as a band. And it's really... Uh, I think relevant right now more than um, some of the other ones. Yeah. So the, the chorus is like, nobody wants a war. Um, and just for all the things that have been happening in the world, it just, be, and, and the other guys would back me up if they were here to agree. We all felt like playing that song recently was the, the right move and um you know it's so the chorus is like um nobody wants a war the peace is kept with all their bombs they're gonna end us all with their greed and lies uh it's all that's on their mind and just for the general state of the world um it's to me, that's that's the most important song that we have. Um, not necessarily, our, it's not our biggest song, but that, you know, if you want to find out who we are, that's a great song. It's, a, it's I think, the B-side to 
Gravity as a, uh, a previous release. Um, anyway, yeah. Beautiful. So everyone, go check out all of those. Check out all of it, to be fair. <laughs> how, how, uh, how was the European shows? Italy, France, Switzerland? Um, Italy, unfortunately, uh, got got cancelled. I think everyone oh. was crazy with the World Cup. Um, <laughs> but... I mean, the the guys in Atreyu are just the best dudes. I mean, we we kind of known Brandon uh, a bit. We we played um, with his with his other band, and we were just like it was just a few shows, um, and hopefully we'll we'll do some more stuff with them. But the shows were great. France was off the hook, and and Holland. I mean, playing in Holland is always awesome um and uh yeah we just kind of like wow i wish this was you know two months longer <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can we just stay here is that all right if we just stay here <laughs> yeah no i mean look you know getting to play shows where because people are amped up right like people love atreyu and so getting to feed off of that energy where people don't really know who we are. And I think, you know, we, we do do some things that are differently. You don't really see, um, amp amps on stage in general, let alone big amps on stage very often anymore. And I think that that's, you know, not, I'm not, there, there is zero shade cause I totally understand why people choose not to do it. But for us, you know, big, bringing in big amps and, you know, everything is still analog performance wise, I think is is a thing that's kind of going the way of the buffalo, unfortunately. It doesn't seem like many people are wanting to deal with that. I, I've got friends and bands that are just like, I'm going to use a Kemper and a Fractal or whatever until I die because I just bring it with my suitcase and like and i'm like i'll be 80 years old bringing my ampeg 8 by 10 stairs because i don't want to i don't want to give it up i you know it's i had so many people be like you know that's completely impractical including my wife who's <laughs> like we have a refrigerator you don't need another one and i'm like yeah but can i get like maybe two or three more because that's <laughs> he said absolutely not but we'll see I'll, i'm gonna wear her down on this. yeah i would yeah, yeah. yeah just keep going you'll be fine you'll get there at the end <laughs> but i think it's something like you you know i mean luke plays with like absolutely massive symbols i is it the switzerland show the sound guy, bless his heart, was like, can you guys all come down and follow? <laughs> we're like, no, because we're not in in-ears. We've got, you know, we're standing on this small stage and Luke's drums are so massive and he hits them so loud. Like, I can't hear my amp if I turn down any lower. <laughs> And, you know we do that thing where you yeah turn it down and you don't <laughs> is that better yeah it's good like sound guys i know this for a fact they they play this thing and the bands also play it back to them where he'll go yeah uh gonna need all the amps on stage to turn down a bit and so we all go eh. And then as soon as, if we do actually turn down, we turn right back up as soon as the show's. <laughs> um, but then the monitor guys do the exact same thing where you're like, can I get some more, uh, you know, vocals from the wedge? And most of the time they'll go like this and just move their hands up without actually pressing the buttons. <laughs> <You're> like, that's <laughs> <not> good. <laughs> and if you're not, you know, if you're not super like if this isn't the thing you do all the time, you just be standing there like up, up, and then I think they play the waiting game to see if you give up asking for more. 
<laughs> there you go. That's an industry secret where the band <laughs> are told to turn down and then they turn back up and the sound guy, you ask him for more on the monitors and they're like, don't touch it. And they're just like, you good? I'm like, oh yeah, that's much better. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely phenomenal. Um, <laughs> you mentioned Swan Dive earlier. That was one of my songs that I picked out that I thought was absolutely unbelievable alongside Loser, You Don't Care, and Closer Than You Know, I absolutely loved as well. Oh, yeah. Absolute all anthems, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, one more thing for myself. Music videos, Steve. Do you love them or hate them? This is in the making of them and the creation and all that sort of stuff, not the finalised product. But do you love making them or do you absolutely hate it? Oh, I love it. I mean, any day you get to go be creative is a good day. I mean, I think, I don't know. I'm going to weigh on this very carefully because I don't want something to come back and bite me later. But <laughs> we can always edit if he needs to. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm not going to say anything I truly regret. But okay. I think that... Any day that I get to be creative that doesn't have me, you know, working in a bar or anything else, you know, I mean, look, for for a lot of for a long time, I was very ashamed to have a day job because there's a a resounding thing amongst artists where if you're an artist you could only you should only be an artist right yeah. like no one wants that side of things um but the reality is all of the the big artists that i know personally all have either invested in something where they're a, a silent but controlling person or they have their own companies or like you know jimmy Eat world those guys own a restaurant i mean there's everyone has side hustles these days and that's not uncommon so you know i know that there's someone out there who gets to to only focus on music for their life and god bless them they've done something right somewhere but for the majority of people i mean huh? I'm friends with tons of dudes and bands and everyone is trying to figure out the same thing. How do I not go crazy having a real day job, but also like afford to float the band to go do a European tour? Like you have to have an income source. Yeah. And so I don't, I, the part that I may regret at some point is if that becomes my life, I could see maybe, I hope not, but I hope that I never get tired of being creative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I just think that at this time, it's so hard to get to be creative. You have to work so hard. I mean, maybe if you come from wealth and your day job is hanging out, having to go shoot a music video, might be like droll or like you know but for me i'm like fuck yeah i get to go not work in a bar and go be around creative people who are who are wanting to you know do a good job for our band and like i mean come on like yeah i love that shit so yeah Totally understand it. How could you be upset? I mean, I get it. Like you, you know, being tired on tour, and like I, I do think that there is like a difference in artist sizes, right? So if your band is is a full time thing, meaning that you are doing like forty hours per week or whatever only dedicated to that you know and like no one wants to see billy joel play after he's slept you know on someone's floor right <laughs> like you don't want to like right you don't want to pay a hundred dollars to go see billy joel play and he's tired and lethargic and he's like i just drove eight hours and i slept on someone's floor i mean that's kind of the reality of punk rock anyway i mean 
I slept in a Walmart parking lot many times on tour. But we're, like, <laughs> we're so broke, we can't afford a hotel room. We're in a brand new region. We don't know anyone here to stay with. We've got, you know, we've got to go from like, you know, South Carolina to Miami and we have to be there tomorrow at four. The only choice is to drive through the night, but your driver's so tired. Walmart parking lot it is. And, you know, you get what you get. Um, <laughs> you know, but you have that fire and, and, you know, but you don't want the same thing from going to see the Foo Fighters, right? Or like... Yeah. Imagine paying, you know, a thousand dollars for Taylor Swift tickets and her just being like, guys, I just didn't really sleep very well. So uh, we're going to cut the set short tonight. Like you can't, it's a different, it's Fuck just a all. different, you know, <laughs> the expectation artist wise, you know, changes once you get yeah. beyond a certain level. It's weird. So. I can't explain why that makes sense, but it makes total sense. Because like at the same time, you're like, I don't want a punk man to sleep in their car in a car park, but at the same time, kind of do. It adds to it. I don't know why. It just does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> you know what's... This is a, a fun fact. Um, sleeping in Walmart parking lots with, like, in Florida during, like, monsoons is some of the best sleep I've ever had in my life. Um... I know it doesn't make any sense, but just um, so I, I have like a, a white noise app on my phone and that's what I sleep to is is rain on the car roof because it's like this weird comforting thing from pulling over at Walmart parking lots and sleeping, you know, just being absolutely exhausted and overperforming, not eating well and just that whole punk rock element of whatever the show is going to happen as long as we can get there the show is going to happen i love it i'm right there with you i have a white noise app too so i totally get it but i love the idea of the monsoon being like here just in the fucking tidal wave or in the sea just like the, the car just bobs on the on the river it's like this is lovely this is rocking me to sleep this <laughs> yeah no i mean that's it's a safe place <laughs> phenomenal <laughs> Um, one last question for myself. I know I said that before, but I actually have another one. <laughs> when you first started this journey, you know, with your dad being a jazz musician, getting into music since you knew exactly what it was, did you ever think this is where you'd be today? I mean, <clears throat> kind of. Um, I, I, you know, to some extent, there's an element of luck involved. Um, but I never really take luck as a as a part of the equation, you know. Yeah. Uh, you <clears throat> surround yourself with driven people who want to be better and are talented. Um, take pride in your recording, and you know, I mean, it's not necessarily reinventing the wheel. How to do it? There, there are ways to do it that. Um, it's, I think the other elements of it, finding, um, people that are willing to go out on a limb and help you when they don't really need to, um, you can attract those people in your life, but also being in the industry, you will find people that share your beliefs and share your values. And so, um, I've always taken the approach of I'm going to do this. This this is the goal. Like hard stop. What's the goal? To make more music. What do I need to, to get there? I need money and I need it to be um, successful enough that I get to make music again. It's really like a junkie sort of thing. Um, so did I think that I would end up here? I always hoped that I I would. I, I've been in so many bands at this point. I mean, um, 
kind of like I like I mentioned earlier, I did the hired gun for for things, um, <clears throat> and now Low Lives being like the the tenth tenth band that has been with a label doing tours. Um, you know, I never get tired of it. So, you know, for, for this to be a band that I'm a member of and not a hired gun for, that was the stated goal from all of us when we decided to push this thing further. I mean, Lee and Luke, they both get offers all the time to go um, fill in for someone on vocals or drums or guitar or whatever. Um, they could easily go back to being hired guns. So they've chosen to do the hard part, which is really nurture what we've built together. Um, and so I think like that's that's the, you know, the goal is always to play more music. Um, luckily, we're at a point where we have been doing this long enough that people are caring and we get to go do more music and we get to go on tour with Alkaline Trio and we get to do <clears throat> aftershock and louder than life i mean any of those things are they're all individual dreams come come true right um so you know there is an element of people believing in us that is out of your control but as long as you believe in yourself enough to at least see what it takes because unfortunately it's like anything else you know like how many people are like i want to have a podcast someday and you're like hey okay well you got to really get your shit together you have to be good at interviewing people you have to have you know what your show, show is going to be about you got to have the physical equipment like nothing is nothing is just easy like it all takes work and effort and you guys are you're great at what you do oh so, I mean, you know, like, but you know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't yeah, just yeah. like some people think that things just happen. And I yeah. think, you know, especially for me living in Hollywood for as long as I did, I got to see how many people show up to Hollywood expecting it to just happen. And then when it's like, yeah. okay, you know, if you want to be an actor, like you gotta have headshots, gotta, you know, volunteer on set for things like you 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 don't I mean I guess sometimes it does happen where someone just has a viral moment whether that's like on the internet or real life where like Harrison Ford just happened to be there or like I, I just read this thing about Johnny that getting the nightmare before Elm Street was bored went to an open casting and now we have Johnny Depp right Excellent. like yeah you know, not to say that he didn't work for, for what he did. He absolutely did. But like that doesn't happen that often. But if you want to do things, it's a very systematic, like I'm going to practice. I will take lessons or I will figure it, figure it out. Then I will surround myself with quality musicians or I will go to shows and try and meet people who are involved in the music the same way that I want to be involved. Like it's not, there are steps that you can move forward to at least influence your outcome. And I have always done that. And I think that, did I expect to wind up here? Like, kind of, yeah. I mean, no one knows the the end journey, right? But like, I've always known that I wanted to continue doing this. And I have continued doing it. And I will continue doing it. Beautiful. I don't think you could have said that any better. To be honest, that was absolutely beautiful, word for word. That was stunning. Thank you. <laughs> it's my inspiration. He's he's right here. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful little pup. <laughs> Steve, thank you so much for taking that time to talk to us today. It really means the absolute okay, world. Like I said, to to any day that I don't have to be behind a bar or whatever else I do in my you know Clark Kent job, you know, <laughs> thank you guys for caring enough about low lives and caring enough about the album that we put out i mean that's you know going back to what you said how's the response been you guys want to talk to me for 90 minutes about my thoughts that's amazing it's you know I, again just 
all of the gratitude and appreciation. No, not at all, man. But seriously, this has been phenomenal. Like I've absolutely loved it hearing all your thoughts and feelings on things and getting to know you better and getting to know low lives better you know, vicariously through you, you know. So yeah. And like but all seriously though, the album is like Jamie said, is fucking stunning from start to finish. So, oh, yeah. you know, and I've seen a few of my friends that I've seen on Instagram have been posting about it as well when it came out saying, you need to fucking listen to this band because they're unbelievable. So when we were offered the chance to talk to you, I was like, yes, please, because they're unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And it, it's, you know, it's nice to, it's nice to have people. I, I We had this conversation in the band where we were like, are, are we a niche sort of thing? Like, kind of like feeling like we're a bit niche now like um what i mentioned about uh showing up with real amps and and recreating the things you know not like because nowadays you can roll in and you can sample your entire um tone and everything from the album and you can have that exact tone like if you use some vintage marshall to get that tone you don't have to bring the vintage Marshall with you and, or like, you don't even need to have a speaker on stage in order to produce sound for an audience. Right. And so we're, we're kind of just like, man, how long until sound guys don't know how to mix a live band where they're not, they're so used to things being either pre-recorded or just like, is your Kemper hooked up to the mic or to the, the XLR? Like, yeah, okay. So then we've got a show and we're like, no, we're going to use the vintage marshals and we're gonna load in, um, you know, an Ampeg eight by 10 up four flights of stairs because fuck it, this is like, you know, like, this is who we are. And so to hear people into like our, our album is real tones, like everything's real on it. And there's a warmth to that, that, you know, like, again, I'm not throwing shade on anyone who uses digital stuff. It is a tool that you can use and good on you for playing music. We're choosing to do a different thing. And that thing is, Weirdly, the thing that's been done the most in history, we're just <laughs> now back and, uh, <laughs> you know, but it's it's nice to hear that people are are into the record and, you know, um, I don't think we use any auto-tune. Uh, Lee, Luke, and Jax are just really fantastic singers and Lee is like a one-take wonder. Um when it comes to, to tracking and, you know, um, it's the real, it's the real thing. So, you know, you guys appreciating it just reinforces that. So that's really nice. Absolutely. Steve, before we get, let you get out of here, any plugs, social medias, websites, where can we send people to check you guys out? Yeah. I mean, um, we're probably most active on our Instagram. Um, so we do try and respond to everyone. Um, but, you know, uh, we are lowlives.com is, is our website. Um, and we're just, we're, we're, we're not sitting in an ivory tower. I mean, it might take a minute cause we all are four guys with real lives, but we're, we're about it. And, you know, we love to see, people reaching out to us and, and, you know, come say hello at a show. We've got our tour dates up. Um, and then, you know, wherever you want to stream, we've got content out there. We've on our, our, uh, YouTube, we've got music videos. We, we did a really cool three part story sort of, um, like continuous through, uh, three singles. Um, uh, we shot that with uh, this guy, Cyrus, who is, um, he plays young Derek Zoolander in the second uh, Zoolander. So he's the the star of that. Okay. Um, 
So, you know, there's there's a bunch of cool stuff. I mean, we're we're happy to continue doing it as long as people will have it. And then you if you're not having it, we're still going to do it anyway because it's for us. So, Perfect. I love it so much. Steve, my friend, this has been unbelievable. Thank you so much. I wish you every success with the record going forward. And I hope the Alkaline Trio Tour is fucking unreal over here. Yeah. It'd be a pleasure to have you back. Oh, hell yeah. I would love to come back anytime. And if you want to talk about whatever, I will talk until Zoom cuts us off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which I don't think is ever. So probably the award Guinness would record for the longest podcast ever recorded. Threaten <laughs> me with a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, man, thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate it massively, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day, my friend. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you as well. Thanks so much. See you later, see you later man. Take it easy. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.